today. Our new favorite form, the residential listing agreement, which has changed. Uh, so what is the biggest change in the residential listing agreement? Do you guys remember hearing about or have you been paying attention? What's going to be the biggest change? Not offering buyer compensation. Not offering buyer compensation. Not offering right? anything. No, no broker to broker compensation anymore. So it's it's now you don't walk in and say, I'm going to list your house for 6% and pay the other side three. It's just, I'm going to come in and list your house for three. There's no broker to broker compensation. Um, it still begs me to question what's going to be the validity, validity of having an MLS system other than it's now just basically a place to list houses. There's no more um, protected offer of compensation between brokers anymore, which was the main point why uh, real estate agents uh, developed the MLS was to protect payment to the buyer's agent. So that is now <laughs> disappeared. Which you're going to be gone. questioning soon. Yes, I'm going to be asking that question very soon. All right. So this is what's coming out. It's coming out next week. I think it's next Tuesday uh, that these forms are hitting. And then they go into effect the 17th of August. Um, I'm pretty darn sure this is probably about as close as we're going to get to the final draft. They put them out a week or 10 days or two weeks early, actually. And I'm sure there's going to be a million uh, real estate agents who think that they're the smartest people on the planet because we all just have that ego that think that words and things need to be changed. They might find some spelling errors. They might find some grammar errors. Things like that might be changed. But I'm pretty sure we're at the kind of heart of what this contract is really going to look like. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the grid where we start off. The very first thing is going to be our listing period, just like it always has been. It just looks different now than the old listing um, agreement. We have a beginning date and an end date. That's it. Simple. Not a number of days, just beginning date, end date, and uh, always ending at 11.59 p.m. All of our days our expiration days always end at 11.59 p.m. Now, really important, not to exceed 24 months, okay? So let's just pull up into a little bubble here because I took the language out of 4G so we don't have to read it down there later. So, so smart. Isn't that easy? The maximum listing period allowed by law, this is a law, for residential property improved uh, with one to four units is 24 months from the date this agreement is made. This restriction does not apply if the seller is a corporation, an LLC, or a partnership, okay? And now this part's kind of important too. It is unlawful to record or file this listing agreement or a memorandum uh, or notice thereof with the county recorder. So there was once a time when I was talking to a company and their thing was, look, we'll give you a deal on when you purchase the house, if you sign a future listing agreement with us. So they would sign an indefinite listing agreement, right? More than 24 months long. And then they would take that listing agreement, type up a memorandum and then file it with the county recorder on the property so that they could, it was a, it was a title. It became a title uh, 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 item. And so if they tried to go sell that house with somebody else, this memorandum would pop up in a title search saying, nope, wait a second, you owe country real estate this listing, or if not, you owe them a certain amount of money. So, um, you know, a really smart strategy that apparently California didn't think was uh, legal. And so they created a law about a year, year and a half ago now that uh, makes it illegal to record listing agreements with the county recorder's office and have a listing agreement over 24 months. All right. So what happens at the end of two years? Um, not sure if you have to let it fully expire and then re-sign it. I do not believe that you can extend it with the modification of terms. You cannot extend it. You have to let it expire and then sign a new listing agreement. Yes, Randy. So you have a listing period, uh, say it's six months, but then you also have that reserve uh, continuation of right uh, the city shall be for so many years. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, put it in there for whatever, six months, and then you're worried, you're concerned, if it expires, you're concerned that the seller, they, the, we've all had them, they use, 
this buyer that I showed them. Oh, that's as, uh, so <coughs> I never knew that you could file that. With, you, could, you could file this listing uh, with the Baptist check that a continuation period of 90 days. So if uh, somebody comes in with this particular buyer and goes, you know, in the title search, they find out that. No, you can't, you cannot report it with the county reporter. No, that's what it said. You cannot report it. With the county reporter this listing agreement or the continuation no what what you can do is when you find out uh who the new agent is you can share your continuation period and the names with that agent but uh and then you have to just stay vigilant on it that and there's it, some place that there's a form or something that we fill that out on. Okay. yeah we'll get to that we'll get to that here okay. when we get to that spot all right so we have the maximum length we have the listing price, right? Pretty basic property specific listing. So this is going to default as a uh, residential one through four. If it's a manufactured home or a probate conservatorship or guardianship, then you check either one of these two boxes. It'll auto, auto populate either your manufactured home listing addendum or your probate listing addendum, okay? As with all of our forms, before we talk about compensation, we always have the disclaimer that says real estate commissions are not fixed and they are set by each broker individually and may not be, and they may be negotiated between the seller and broker, sorry. Uh, and we have the BCA, the form BCA, which is going to be um, bundled with your risk residential listing agreement. So it's going to show up prior to the listing agreement. You're gonna have your agency disclosure, your possible representation, your fair housing, your uh, wire fraud, then it's going to be the BCA, and then it's going to be the residential listing agreement followed by your seller's advisory, right? So those are all the things that are bundled. Okay, compensation to seller's broker. So I underlined only the seller side of the transaction. Okay, this is all we are negotiating now. Only what they are going to pay us to sell their house. Very simple, right? No more math, no more anything, just this is what I'm going to charge you to sell your house. It can either be a percentage of the listing price, or it could be a flat rate over here in this section. Or if you're doing a percentage of the listing price and a fee for transaction coordinator, any other kind of fee that there might be, you would put that here. If you're going to charge them for photos, it could be a percentage of the listing price and $300 for photos. However you negotiate it, it's entirely up to you guys. Okay, so you have choices here, all right? Uh, additional compensation to the seller's broker if the buyer is unrepresented. Anybody wanna give this one a stab? A lot of silence, a lot of silence. Yeah, 4C, right? Well, it's 2C2, but yeah, 4C. What does it mean to get additional compensation to the seller's broker if the buyer is unrepresented? Okay, so, so in other words, the buyer is, is your buyer, right? Not your buyer. No. Not your buyer. No. Not your buyer. Any buyer now has to have what before they go see a house? Oh, buyer broker. They have to have a buyer broker agreement. Are they forced to have a buyer broker agreement? Another agreement. No. They're not forced to have a buyer broker agreement. They're only forced to have a buyer a buyer representation agreement if they're going to work with an agent. But a buyer is not required by law to work with the real estate agent when they buy a house. So they can come in and look at a house and be unrepresented without a buyer representation agreement. All right. Now, if that's the case, they either the seller can let them in the house or you can let them in the house, but you cannot negotiate terms with them. They are unrepresented. So you cannot conduct real estate business with an unrepresented buyer. So if an unrepresented buyer is going to buy your listing, do you think you're going to have more work or the same amount of work? More work. More. Probably more work. So if you want to have that conversation with your client and check the additional box, you can say, hey, look, I'm going to charge you 3% to sell your house. But if we end up getting an offer from an unrepresented buyer and we go under contract with the unrepresented buyer, I'm going to have to do twice the amount of work now. So I'm going to want 4% or 4.5% or 5%. So I might add 
another one, one and a half or 2% or something in this field right here after I check this box. So this allows me to be compensated for the additional work. So you're asking the seller for more money. Yeah, I because... can't get it from the buyer. The buyer does not have an agreement. They are unrepresented. There's only one place it can come from, the seller. So you're asking the seller for additional what if the money. Seller says no? Then you're going to have to struggle with an unrepresented buyer and get paid the same amount you would get paid anyway. So the seller says they don't want to give you money for unrepresented buyers, then they don't. That's part of your negotiation. So if no other brokerage company is involved in the sale, of the seller's property because the buyer is not represented by a real estate agent. This box would make the seller agree to pay the broker, us, the additional amount specified if checked for services rendered. So you're getting paid for real estate services by taking care of this unrepresented buyer. So you should always check that and negotiate that. I, you should try to negotiate. I would not pre-check anything. I would- Oh, I mean, not check it without your client's knowledge. Yeah, yeah, but... I would, yeah, never pre-check boxes. But yes, this is a conversation for sure. Okay, so I have these two arrows here on this next one because these are related to one another. So first of all, when you're taking a listing agreement, you want to establish a continuation period. And you also want to know if the seller that you're going under contract with here has any other continuation periods that are still active. That's why these two are, I have them highlighted together. So first of all, when we want to establish a continuation period, as was Randy was talking about, we're coming to the end of our listing and the seller does not want to extend it anymore with us. But the house has been heavily shown and some of those people have been pretty legitimate buyers. You're going to want to put a list together of those potential buyers and you need to deliver it to the seller prior to the expiration of this contract. And you put a number of days here, it could be 10, 15, 30, 60, 90, it could be whatever you negotiate. I've seen them as high as 180, which is half a year, right? And what that basically says to the seller is, Mr. Seller, here is a list of potential buyers that showed the house, that saw the house while I was your listing agent. If you accept an offer from any one of these people, I have the right to represent you. All right, I have the right to represent you and I have the right to get paid. It's a continuation of this contract. They also need to tell their new agent that they have this continuation period and that these are the list of buyers because what this next section says is the seller, the homeowner has an obligation to pay a previous broker. So they need to list who that previous broker is and the compensation to the above broker is owed if property is transferred to, and this would be a list of all of those names of all of those people that came to see the house, which means that if I'm the new listing agent and I receive a list of 10 people and one of those 10 people comes back to buy the house, I no longer have any obligation to that seller to represent them in that transaction. It's the way that the broker can step away from responsibility and the old broker steps back in to responsibility. Does that make sense, guys, everybody? Yeah. The only thing I don't understand about that or a question about it is, if a continuation period, let's say, is 30 days, so within that 30 days, this the listing agent talking to the seller. Define that 30 days. That 30 days before they're under contract with someone else. 30 days. So, so it's, thir it's 30 days from the expiration of, of your contract to the acceptance of a contract with that buyer. So if they accept a contract within 30 days, if you set 30 days, right? So your listing ends here, 30 days is here. If they accept a contract in the middle somewhere, then you're back in and the new, a new agent is out. The new broker is out. What if they post a contract? 
they I mean why would a buyer why why would a buyer why why would a buyer do that? The buyer doesn't give a crap. Buyer doesn't give a crap. Buyer doesn't care who made. But does it matter? The, the new agent. So so you're telling me that the new agent's gonna be able to convince a buyer's agent to tell a buyer to post date something and wait two weeks before they get their offer accepted? No, the buyer's gonna want it. The buyer's oh, gonna I, give them the I, I, I can see a seller yeah. accepting it saying, okay, after two weeks, we'll, we'll sign No, as soon as it's signed, it's you know, so the, again, I don't think there's a buyer out there that's gonna wait two weeks to get their offer accepted. You can't post date a signature. It starts when it's signed, right? So what you would have, because a buyer, so let's just say for conversation, your listing ends July 31st and you have until August 31st. And now I'm a buyer that was, that has seen the house before it's August 7th. And I want to finally write an offer on this house. Uh, my, my buyer's agent is not going to date that RPA September 1st, when it's August 7th. All right, and if they send it through DocuSign, they can try all they want to manually change the date. DocuSign is gonna stamp that thing August 7th, digitally. There's gonna be a electronic paper trail that they can't escape. So I, I just, I mean, I think the situation that you're- I think, that you're, I think, I'm, I think I'm more worried about a buyer coming to see the seller and uh, our, our contract is expired and they work out some sort of a deal to buy the house unrepresented for sale by own. Mm -hmm. Good. I, think, I, think I'm, I think I'm worried about that, but they still got to wait that 40 days. Yeah, so they would flip it over to a FISBO type of a situation yeah. and not have any representation and wait 30. Could happen. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, think are, are there outs? Sure. Are people devious? Absolutely. Is it likely to happen to you in a 10-year period of time? Maybe once, but I don't think it's going to be a, a regular occurrence. So, okay. so again, the purpose here is to establish your continuation period when you are uh, agreeing to a contract with the seller, and it's also to ask them questions if they have ever been under contract before and if they have a continuation period. Uh, and again, the continuation period is not automatic. You must provide the seller with the list of names of the people that came to see the house. So what does that, um, what burden does that put on you as their listing agent to make sure you can maintain your uh, continuation period? You gotta make that list. So you've you gotta got to ask them. every you single you time you get a, a, a listing, a showing. a showing, I mean, you not only have to take the name of the agent in the brokerage, but you got to get the name of the, of the actual client. Now, what's the easiest way? Because if you ask your a list, a showing agent, hey, yeah, you want to see the house on Sunday? Great. What's your buyer's name? They're probably not going to tell you. No. What's the easiest way to make sure you get it? Can I see your buyer's broker? Mm, probably won't show you the BRBC. Probably won't show you the BRBC. They, you can force them to show you a prequel. Yes. Right. So if you say, "Hey, all of my showings are mandate that uh, that you have a prequalification letter," then you're going to get a prequal from a lender. And guess what? It's going to have right there at the very top. Their name. It's going to have their name. Now you got the buyer's name. Now you can build your list. So let's get back to you know, listing agent 101, doing it the right way instead of the lazy way, make sure you have a prequal letter before you allow the showing. Oh my God. That way you can get a list of everybody's name. This has always been this way. This is not new to this contract. This has always been in the right, contract. Right. It's just, it's, it's, well, it's, it's just laziness. During, during COVID. You know? <laughs> yeah, during COVID, away. during it's COVID, we used to, easy in COVID. yeah, it was really easy in COVID. But now it's gone away a bit everybody's just showing everything yeah it's People. it's definitely also like the last couple of showings i've had and i asked for a prequel and they're like oh i haven't done that yet okay, okay. you know so, i have a guy or so, i have a girl so let's and then, back this and up then they a little do bit. it okay. and then it turns out they don't qualify let's back this up a little bit now if i'm a buyer and i don't want to show a house i'm gonna to have to establish a brbc with my buyer's agent what am i probably gonna to have to have before they sign that brbc 
So prequel, there's not going to be, honestly, guys, this is all really good stuff because yeah. you're probably never going to be showing a house to an unqualified buyer ever again, unless nice. you do like the, you know, the, the open house uh, one day, I'll let you in and show it to you little types of things. But if you're, if you're going to be signing real BRBCs with clients, they're going to have to show you what their buyer, uh, the, the BIPP and the BIFI, right? The financial forms. I think it's the BIFI, whatever it is. Um, so you guys, you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna be establishing their capacity to buy the house before you show them the house, which means they're gonna be talking to your lender and you're gonna have a prequal. So if all buyers are gonna have a prequal before they go show, it should be very easy for all listing agents to ask for a copy of that prequal before they allow you to see. I the feel house. like for a, a buyer's agent now, it's gonna be they're gonna be looked at as aggressive. It's like. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to need to see a prequel, and I'm also going to need you to sign this, and we're going to talk about how much you're going to pay me. Like, right? Absolutely. You know? yeah, so piss somebody off, and yeah. then they're going to be like, well, so-and-so doesn't make me. Yeah, they will. Yeah, they all will. Or they'll, you know, smooth your mouth, talk to them, then make them sign it. Yeah. A lot more, a lot more difficult conversations on the buyer side, which is interesting because we're willing to have those difficult conversations with sellers, right? We go to a listing agreement. We're like, hey, we're going to talk about money. I love let's difficult go. conversations. You know, Those are my favorite. Your favorite. Every day. Let's, let's do it. Okay. Next section. Items intended to be included or excluded. So these are items that are not fixed. So items included are items that are not fixtures that they want to leave with the sale of the home. Right? Because if an item is fixed to the house, it comes with the home. So these are non-fixed items that they want to include. And then excluded items are the opposite. They are fixed items or fixtures that they want to take with them. So give me an example of an item that is um, not a fixture that they would want to leave and include with the house. Ooh. Ooh. Um, 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 a uh, chandelier? No, that's it's a fixed. fixture. It's bathroom mirror? That's fixed. Piano. Not necessarily. Piano. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's, it's automatically checked in that box on... Uh, the RPA is bathroom mirrors are considered fixed oh. now. Okay. A pool table. Wait, what's considered fixed? A piano? piano? No. Oh. Bathroom mirrors. Oh, yeah, yeah. Grand piano, a pool oh. table, a, a jacuzzi. Unit? Cooling unit? What kind of cooling like unit? A, like a swamp cooler? Swamp piano? cooler depends on how it's in the in the house. Because most the of window, them are fixed into the window and they're bolted in. I'm talking about one like a stand up one. Stand up one, yes, that would work. Yes, okay. a stand up one. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, so items like that, right? A ride along mower, personal property, uh, refrigerator, right? A refrigerator is not affixed to the house. So that those are items that they intend to be included. They are non fixtures that they are including with the house. Okay, excluded items. Give me items that are fixtures that they want to take with them. They want to exclude them. Chandelier. Chandelier. <laughs> what, what else? Yeah, because you went to Italy and bought it. And it's like, you know, like- you What about a dishwasher? What? Hardware? Like, do, like the Hardware. Hardware. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Door handles, door knobs, curtains, curtains rod, curtain rods, <laughs> right? Curtains, curtains and curtain rods. Yeah. Things that are fixed to the house that they want to take with them. A lot of the time, most of the time, it's, it's lighting or maybe it's a special window. Maybe they had a- a window popped out and they put a beautiful piece of stained glass in and they want to take it with them. So they take the stained glass with them. So things like that, right? Things that are fixed to the house that they want to take with them come in the items excluded section. Now, really important little caveat here. Let's pull open the bubble, see what it says. Okay, regardless of whether the items are listed here, the final decision on what stays or goes must be negotiated in the RPA. This is just a guide. Right, this guide serves you to inform you of the seller's preferences. So the seller could say these items are included or excluded. It doesn't mean, even if you put it in the MLS that this goes and this stays, it doesn't mean jack unless in the RPA, the agreement that takes place between the buyer and the seller, that these items are discussed. Okay, so it must be in the RPA still. This just gives you an idea of what the seller really wants. But yes. <laughs> Since I'm going to be doing a listing agreement, I still cannot use those until August. So I use the old one now. Yeah, they've been released like before. We were no, these are not being released for, for another week. I would say start using them in another week. Yeah. Yeah. I would start using them. But soon. if I have to do a listing agreement today, 
So if you have to do a listing agreement today, then there's going to need to be an amendment form that you're going to have to have amended so by all August. Your listings end up with yeah. listings all your listings. All your listings are going to have to be amended. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and right now it's probably really smart to when you go there, just negotiate your your side again and just say yes. You know, for another month we can offer a compensation, but let's just do it on a case by case basis. Let's let the buyer ask in the offer, you know, and just, just go get your side and only your side. Oh. Probably the easiest way. Otherwise, cause you're going to have to amend that eventually anyway. And, and, and all of the current listing agreements that are at 4%, 5%, 6% or whatever, where there was some kind of half and half or some sort of split, they're all going to have to be modified because even though the, uh, seller still may be willing to offer that it has to come in the form of concessions. Now it's no longer being mandated by the seller to offer it as a, as a cooperating commission in the MLS. So you're going to have to adjust all of your current <laughs> listings uh, come August 17th to just the amount you're going to get paid. But yay. But, right. but, but um, maybe also have that conversation. Are you still willing to? Well, I guess. Are you still willing to call, to give somebody concessions? Is right. always a conversation still, right? Because there are ways to, for people to get paid. Okay. Leased items, leaned items. So this is kind of informational stuff. Do they have a propane tank? Do they own it or is it leased? Do they have solar? We love solar. Is it leased or is it leaned? Right, those are different. What is the lean solar versus the leased solar? The leaned one is if you have a pace or a hero and it's attached to your property taxes. So that was one way that they did that. They attached them to the property taxes. That's a lean because it shows up on a title report as a lean, not as a lease. Alarm systems, water softeners, uh, other items. With so when the pace and hero loans came out, these ones that were leaned, they were for. Uh, fixing your house it was energy efficiency loans so it included new hvac systems solar systems and windows and doors so that's why you see those show up in the lean items these this section 5b is specifically targeted to those types of home improvement loans that were attached to your property taxes this lease item section is just you know i, I got a leased solar system a leased a water softener because they cost a lot of money so what is the point of putting these in here? It's for the seller to disclose that to you. Why? What do you need to provide in the first seven days once you go under contract? Disclosure. Disclosures. And what is part of the disclosure packet? Swifty. No, all of the lease <laughs> items, all the lease, all the lease agreements. All the lease agreements that you have with all of these companies. Right? So how many times have you guys had to go dig out the solar lease and share it with the buyer? Many times. Right? Many times. So same thing with alarm systems, water softeners. If you have anything that's leased like that, it has to be delivered within the first seven days. So as you're taking this agreement and they're checking all these boxes, you start letting them know. Please start getting your solar, your lease equip, your lease uh, contracts available because I'm going to need them. Okay, smart. Yes, yes, your uh, The ring system. A lot of people have ring or some other form of that. Is that a, a leased item? No. There's no lease. The ring system costs two hundred dollars. So if you can't afford it without leasing it, you probably shouldn't have one. So you just write the check. Now there are a monthly subscription, yes, but that is not a lease. That is a monthly subscription. So because a lot of times it's uh, are you leaving the ring system or are you taking so, it with you? Very next section right here. So he's he's got the Darla's today, jumping one step ahead. All right, smart home features that the seller prefers to include and smart home features that the seller prefers to exclude. Now, why does this have to We're be always thinking ahead. Why does this have to be negotiated again? Well, because that ring system is that ring system by your front door a fixture or not a fixture? It's not. It's a fixture. It's it attached to the house. Because uh, all the sensors are attached uh, yeah. to the windows. And right? The, uh, so, well, alarm systems, sensors are all attached. Smart home features. Sometimes the smart home feature is where the uh, is a, a light switch. Right? The light switch is smart. Thermostats. Thermostats. They're all attached. They're all fixed. So there's a lot of argument over, is it personal property or is it part of the house? Well, it's a fixture. Yeah, but I bought it specific. Well, it doesn't matter. It's a fixed. So talk about it because there are some things, for example, like my speakers right here. All right. Are these, 
attached? Do these affix to the house or not affix to the house? Is the television affixed or not affixed? Well, I don't know. The rule now says that the the bracket holding it against the wall is affixed, but the TV is not. So you can take the TV, but leave the bracket? Right? So, and now I think the most recent version of the RP, I got to go back and read. I think now the bracket you can take now too. But these are things you have to talk about because you don't want to get in a fight, right, over the speakers. Or, or for example, I, I probably have, I don't know, six or $7,000 worth of speakers at my house. Some of them are attached, some of them are not. I don't want a mistake over that. And they say, no, I am get, uh, get to keep all the speakers. That's that's a lot of money. So if you were to sell your house, you would maybe negotiate that? Those, those speakers go with me. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not leaving them behind. I'm taking them all off the walls. I'm taking the brackets off the walls. They're all going with me. So you want to make sure. What are we talking about? Doorbells, thermostats, speakers, light switches, outlet plugs, any smart home device. Just conversation to have with your seller. What do you have here and are you willing to leave it or do you want to take it? Pretty simple. If you want to take it, could you say what about before? Yeah, yeah maybe you should out. just take it you off can. before. You can take you it know. off before or you're no, just, or you're you just very clear. To, like, think about it. It is very clear in your counter offer that these items are not part of the house, but <laughs> why make it a negotiation? Because like you your light for your painting, you're going to take the painting. You can leave lights fixed. I'm going to take the light. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, marketing, MLS and marketing. So the property will be marketed in the MLS, in the, in the following MLS. So you're supposed to put the primary, okay? Um, you're supposed to let them know if, if the one that you're putting it in is not the primary, but it's supposed to be primary to the property's location. Uh, they need to know if it isn't. So for example, if you're taking a listing in Santa Clarita, let's say, Lacey, and you're no longer a member of SRAR, but you're going to put it in Tatch Me, they have to know. Right, then you're not putting it in SRA. Okay. Uh, the seller instructs the broker not to take or use photographs in marketing except as required by the MLS. So you have an extremely, extremely private person. They don't want any photos of the inside of their house, their gun safe, or this, that, or the other. What does our MLS require if we're not going to put any photos in? Picture of the front of the house from the street. That's it. That's the minimum requirement. Somebody's got a listing right now with that, and it's so yeah. strange. Like I don't. Who knows? And it's so they're they're not going to show it unless you put in an offer. Yeah. Because the inside is probably trash. So. Oh. It's probably okay. get an offer accepted, and then yeah, yeah. you have an opportunity to go in and look at it. Okay. Timing and presentation of offers. So it defaults. Seller instructs broker to present all offers received as soon as practicable. Right. That doesn't mean if I receive an offer at 11 o'clock at night, I immediately call my seller and present it to him. No, the next morning is satisfactory. OK. Oh, and then there's an or box you can check it says or offer shall pre be presented on blank date or blank number of days after the property is listed is active. So strategy. Right. These are all different strategies. It could be. I'm going to release my property on Wednesday and I'm not going to present offers until Sunday. So you need to put that in here. You need to put your strategy in here so that you and your seller are on the same page and they don't try to say, you know, that you didn't represent them properly. So depending on how you're going to present offers, it must be described in the listing agreement. Okay. Buyer supplemental letters. So these are the love letters. Right, so default, seller instructs the broker not to present letters. If the seller really, really wants them, he has to opt into it. So he'd have to check the box that says seller instructs broker to present buyer letters. If seller requests or relies on buyer letters, the seller is acting against the broker's advice. Okay, that's how we, how we kind of indemnify ourselves against somebody using a letter to make a decision. I thought you're not okay. really supposed to do it at all. You're supposed to do what the seller tells you to do. If the seller wants to break laws, the seller is more than willing to break laws. <laughs> Isn't that a law? It's a fair housing violation. Yeah, it is a law, but uh, so is underage drinking. How many times did you try that? <laughs> uh, yeah. That's my dad's so, fault for wearing a liquor store when I was in high school. <laughs> right? So, underage drink. Never, right? So, what? Never. Underage drinking. Yeah, that's good. Drink underage? You guys are funny. 
You're, okay, it's a joke. Yeah, no, I was like, <laughs> Barlow was taking it serious. <laughs> Not, no, no, but here's mean. the deal. Never, like, it would say, come on, Barlow's and James. That yeah. doesn't count. Well, okay. Barlow's so, <laughs> so if your seller wants to use letters, they need to know that they're doing it against our advice. And there's more language in paragraph 7C that, again, indemnifies us from being responsible. If they want us to turn over the letters, we have to turn over the letters. All right. Okay. Investigation reports. So, what is looking at it the way you see it right here? What's supposed to happen when we take this listing? Order the NHT. Supposed to order the NHT. How soon? Immediately. Five so, days. Within five days. No. Right there, right? Seller shall order and pay for any reports selected. And it's defaulted in. You've been gone. But this also gives them an opportunity to do all these other things. Now, it's probably not typically standard in our particular area to do some of these. You can. There are other parts of the state where they almost check every single one of them because they know their houses are going to sell immediately fast. And it's the standard of practice in those areas. Might be a good idea, though, to so have automatically checked. So natural hazard, you yeah. can't uncheck it. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's total check. Right, we got to have one of those. Uh, why? Why do we have to have one of these? Insurance. It's the law. It's what's a statutory disclosure? What does statutory mean? Law. law. How many statutory disclosures are there in a resident in a residential transaction? Six. Are they all applicable? Come on, guys, let's go. Name the six statutory TDS. disclosures. Oh, TDS. MCA. MCA MCSA. No. No. You in HD, no TDS, TDS, no. Wait, what? Can you wait? Can can you restart? Restart? Yeah. Statutory, statutory law. by law, law, by not by contract. Day. No disclosures, yeah, which one? <laughs> all of them. No, okay, okay. the big TDS, the, 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 TDS. The 20 pages. Yeah. NHD. We've established those two. What are the other four Jeez. that are statutory? Uh, water conserving flood no okay we're yes. running no. out of this yes yes sorry i didn't i didn't hear you all <laughs> lead, the way lead, lead earth earth okay okay whoa okay slow down yes lead -based yes lead-based paint earthquake fire hardening defensible space nhd tds those are your six statutory disclosures statutory by law spq is contractual it says in the contract that you will fill out an spq there's no law that supports it. So in our contract, in our RPA under seller disclosures, there's a whole section in that whole, what is it, paragraph 14 or whatever it is, that huge list. The first group are collectively statutory and then the other group are not. So, so because an NHD is a statutory disclosure, you have to have it no matter what, it's auto-populated here. Oh, Got to have it, Yeah. so you might as well do it. I like that. Okay, yeah, I like that. Think about. How do you get a hold of a home inspection when the agent the agent won't um, give you the name of the last? Yeah. Uh, are you under contract yet? No. I mean, I would probably reach out to their broker at that point and say, you know, this house did have a home inspection from a buyer's agent. And I'm at, and they were supposed to turn it over to the seller, and I'm asking your listing agent, and he's failing to give me the name of that well, buyer's agent. I guess my whole point is, I I asked the guy why it keeps falling out of escrow, and he said, "Oh, I think it has something to do with the home inspection." But well, yet he, he, he can't. He clearly knows them, but and he's, he's just, not and he's not, he's not, he's not, he's not act. So, what is that a a, a breach of? Acting in good faith between agents. That's that's an ethical violation. Mm -hmm. That's a code of ethics violation. You know something you're failing to tell me. It becomes more serious once you're under contract. Right. But even prior to contract, it's still a code of ethics violation. All right. Okay. So, Mr. Seller, uh, would you like to know ahead of time how much pest damage your house has? Would you like to know whether or not your septic or sewer or your septic is bad or your roof is bad? Yeah, they're going to cost you, but at least you know. So it's not a surprise down the road. What would be the benefit of knowing ahead of time? 
getting it done quicker, like fixing it? Okay, like could quicker? fix it, could fix it immediately if you have the financial means to do it. Oh, I'm not going too far to escrow if I want to pull out or something. Okay, that could also work. What about price negotiation? Okay, that's good. If you know you have a whole mess of work that needs to be done, you might be a little bit more stingy about giving up so much of your price. What happens if you're in negotiation, you haven't done any of these reports, the buyer is hammering away at you and you've really given them a great deal and you're really getting by by the skin of your teeth and, and the seller is about at his bottom line. Then you go get these reports and find out there's $4,000 worth of damage. Who's yeah. going to be pissed? The Your seller. Seller's seller going to be pissed. Be second hand yeah. Right? <laughs> so if you can, get them to do it ahead of time. Get them to do it ahead of time. Do some of the reports expire? Yeah, they do. The Three months? Septic. Septic. It's really only good for a day, but usually you can get it to last longer than that. Well, the cert. The cert's only good for the day of. Um pest report, 30 days, 90 days, whatever it is. But this is what I have found in my experience when I do this ahead of time and too much time happens before I go under contract, I can usually get that pest company to come right back out for almost nothing and just do a real quick over and re give me a new cert because nothing's really changed in 60 days, right? There hasn't been a termite party at the house. So they'll come back and look at it again. Same with the septic. They're usually pretty good about checking it again for you real fast and saying all is good and moving on. Um, why does it have a general, what is a general property inspection? It sounds a lot like the home inspection. Can a seller do a home inspection? Yes. Or does a buyer have to do the home inspection? No. Seller can do it. Seller can have it done. The buyer can have it done. So the seller can offer it to the buyer as evidence of a home inspection, the buyer can accept it and save themselves $400, or they could decide to do another one. So sometimes it's good for a seller to do a home inspection because then he can get ahead of the curve, make the repairs, make the fixes. Again, no surprises. So a lot of options here that I'm pretty sure we're probably not having these conversations with our sellers we're not. going into it. We're saying, yeah, when we get into escrow, we'll do all this stuff. So options there are options for you okay and the next one g exceptions to ownership or title anybody have any idea what that might possibly mean Trust. well basically does anybody else other than the person signing this form have any authority to the house so what does it say down in paragraph 20 the seller warrants that the seller is the owner of the property. No other persons or entities have title to the property and the seller has the authority to both execute this agreement and sell the property. Exceptions to ownership, title, and authority are specified in paragraph 2G. Okay, yes. So who can sign the list? An owner. Any owner. Just one of the owners. So like any owner. joint joint title. Any owners. One, any owner can do that. So what they use, what Dale used to always say to me, which always rang in my head, it takes one to list and two to sell. One to list and two to sell. Only one property owner needs to sign the listing agreement. It can go up on the market. But if you have estranged owners and they don't agree, you're gonna get stuck in escrow. Well, should you put down there if you're just having the, the husband signing it, the wife has moved out? Uh, you, you put down if you wanted to, in additional terms, if you wanted to notate that, you could. Spouse is also a owner. Yeah, well, but that's going to be clear and evident as soon as you go under contract and it pops up on title. It's going to pop up on title right away. Plus, if it takes one to list and two to sell, who must sign the RPA? Both. Both. Yeah, but you don't want to go that long. Yeah, that's a conversation to have. <laughs> Definitely a conversation. Unless you have a court order. Court so order. If you're going, if you're going through a divorce. Totally different. And the judge orders that the husband signs for everything because the wife mm -hmm. is not signing. She's not agreeing to anything. So she's wiped out and just Correct. the husband can sign. Or Correct. the wife. Yeah. Yes, there are always exceptions to the rule, mm -hmm. right? 
ownership. Remember, if you have a conservatorship or a probate, ownership's gonna be way different than the person who has authority to sign. So this says, okay, that the seller is either the seller or uh, the seller, whoever the seller is, they have authority to execute, okay? So whoever is signing, somebody has to have the authority to sign. It's gotta be the legal authority through either a, a conservatorship, a probate, a, a judge's injunction, a court order, whatever it might be, the person signing this contract is the one who has authority. If they don't, or there are exceptions, or there's issues, you're going to want to notate. Okay. So do you put their name there, or what, you, what would you put there? The document that they have to sign? So yeah, so for example, if somebody, is, if there is exception to ownership, then you would put that person's I have I have one of those. Yeah, you put their name in there on the listing agreement. Okay. Seller intends, this is a big one. Don't miss this one. It's really small. Seller intends to include a contingency to purchase a replacement home as part of this transaction. What does that mean? Oh, is that like a one pre sub? Does that have a number attached to it? 1031. 1031. No, this is not an oh, exchange. Okay. This is not an exchange. This is the SPRP. Seller's purchase of the replacement property. They're saying to you, you need to know when we get an offer on this house, part of our negotiation is I want to put an SPRP in my counter offer. I'm telling the buyer he cannot buy my house until I can close on my replacement property. It gets a one extra layer of contingency. There's two contingencies in the SPRP. There's the identification and the ability to get into escrow of the house that they want to buy. And then there's the closing of the house they want to buy. So what does that mean? Offer comes in. I have an SPRP. It says I have 17 days to go find a replacement property. We execute the offer. It sits on day zero. It doesn't move. I have 17 days to go find my replacement house. If I find my replacement house and get it under contract, I notify my buyer and both escrows start at the same time. If after 17 days, I can't find a house, or even after 12 days, I get discouraged and say, there's no house for me, even though I've executed this offer, I can come back and cancel it. I reserve cancellation rights as a seller. One of the very, very few times that the seller has reserved cancellation rights, right? Without having to put the other side in the breach. Seller has a contingency. Okay. I take the offer, I accept it, it sits on day zero, I have 17 days, I go find the property, I get it under escrow. Both escrows are going at the same time. We're getting towards the end of the escrow and for whatever reason now, I am not able to purchase the house that I wanna to go to. Maybe my lender said I can't do it or something happened and I can't close there and I still have my SPRP, the, part, the closing part. I can go back to the buyer and say, sorry, I can't close, you can't buy. Huge bummer for everybody. Keeps you from being homeless. If you don't have an SPRP in place, this contract that you signed with the buyer for your house can close whether you've executed. So you have to move out? You might you got, yeah, you gotta move out. You don't own the house anymore. Go find an apartment, go find a hotel, go find something. So you need to have that conversation with your seller. Hey, when you're selling, where are you moving to? Do you need to be able to close that property before you sell this one? Or do you have a place to go? A lot of times they'll say, yeah, we're going to go stay with family or we're going to go rent or whatever. We don't need, we're okay. We want to sell our house. Sometimes they say, no, I've got to have a replacement property. I'm downsizing. I'm going someplace else. Okay. All right. Seller opt out. So contractually, we're going to put a lockbox and we're going to put up a sign. If they don't want a lockbox and they don't want a sign, they check these boxes here and that opts them out of having a lockbox or a sign at the property. <clears throat> okay, uh, advisories. If it's a short sale, you got to have a short sale advisory. If there's a trust, you do your trust advisory. If it's a uh, bank owned, you do your bank owned. REO, what does REO stand for? Real estate owned. Very good. Very good. Okay. Any other addenda you might want to add? You could add them here. Okay. Let's talk about some of the key points in compensation. So this is compensation terms. D, paragraph 4D. Your compensation is earned and the seller shall pay the broker when any one of these three things happen. 
either you have a completed transaction or the seller or seller default. Okay, so if during the listing period or any extension, the broker or any other broker, uh, seller or any other person procures a ready and willing able buyer. So why does it, so why? So the broker, that's us, any other broker, that'd be any buyer's broker, or if the seller themselves procures a buyer, we get paid, why? What kind of listing agreement is this? It's exclusive. This is an exclusive listing agreement. It gives us the exclusive right to sell, no matter who brings the buyer. Okay, if they purchase the property on any price and terms that are accepted by the seller, provided the buyer completes the transaction or is prevented from doing so by the seller. What does that mean? The seller won't close escrow. Won't close escrow. I'm not going to sell it. I changed my mind. I'm not going to sell it. And then we get to the close of escrow date and the buyer sends a notice to perform, and then the seller still doesn't perform, and then the buyer finally cancels. Who stopped the sale? The seller. You still get paid. All right, when else do we get paid? If during the continuation period, we've given the list of the people, and that person comes back in and buys within that continuation period, then, we get the uh, commission, okay? So that's the second time. The third time is if the seller interferes with the listing. This one's a little bit more devious. So if without the broker's prior written consent, the property is withdrawn from sale, okay? It's withdrawn or it's made unmarketable by a voluntary act of the seller during the listing period or any extension. So if your seller is constantly saying, no, I'm not showing you the property. No, they are not allowed to come here. No, no. Or they, you know, whatever they do, they just, they spoil the house. They go out on social media and say, you don't want to live here. Uh, you know, I've, I've killed five people in the house, but whatever, I don't care. Whatever it is they do, if they interfere with your ability to sell the home, you get paid. What about the tenant? Tenant is a little bit different. I would say no. As you, working with the tenant, the tenant can be unreasonable. The tenant is not the seller. If the seller is making every effort to get people into the house and to have the tenant cooperate, then the seller is doing their job by this contract. So how do you get them to pay? You, this, is, this is a contract. You sue them. Okay. Yeah, you take them to court. <laughs> oh, hey, I had an agreement with this guy. And here's all my proof that he made the house unmarketable. Small claims limit now is like 15 grand. <laughs> it's up there. I think it's higher than it used to be. Yeah. So you probably could go to small claims. If not, you could go try to go bigger. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Additional ways you can get compensated. The buyer breaches and the seller recovers damages. So let's say your commission was supposed to be $3,000. Okay. And um, buyer has a $15,000 EMD in, and there's arguments over it, uh, or whatever the case might be. And somebody goes to court and they sue, seller sues the buyer and the buyer wins, or the seller wins, uh, damages or whatever the damages might be. Uh, so the listing agent gets, um, half of the settlement, not to exceed what their commission would have been. So if your commission was supposed to be $6,000 and they received $9,000, you get $4,500 and call it a day. If they get $12,000, you get your $6,000, they get $6,000. If the seller gets $30,000, you get $6,000 and they keep $24,000. Okay. So that's basically what that means. Okay. So there are, I mean, these, these are extraordinarily rare situations, guys. And typically... In smaller markets like our little smaller market, we're probably not fighting a whole bunch for this. But geez, think about if you were working on three million dollar houses was like your bread and butter, and you're looking at sixty thousand dollar commissions, and it's your livelihood a little more. Probably going to fight for it a little bit harder than we. We we might turn away sometimes. We might fight. We never know. But who knows? Okay, seller compensation obligations to other brokers. This is that important part that talks about, okay, uh, not the continuation period, but what if there's already a continuation period? So 
Talk about these three points with your seller. Seller, have you previously entered into a listing agreement with another broker? If he hasn't, great, you're good. If he has, hmm, okay, question two. Seller warrants that the seller has no obligation to pay compensation to any other brokerage regarding the property unless the property is transferred to any of the individuals or entities specified in paragraph 2C4. That's the list of names of people that have come to see the house already. They gotta, they gotta tell you. So if the end, here's the caveat. If the property is sold to anyone on that list during the time the seller is obligated to compensate the other broker. So if somebody during that continuation period that you're absorbing comes back, then we, the broker, uh, we are not entitled to compensation under this agreement. And we are not obligated to rep represent the seller in such transaction. So if somebody comes from a previous continuation period, we're out. We don't get paid. We have no legal responsibility. We're done. That makes sense? You guys all got that? All right. Again, maximum listing period. We've already established that, 24 months. Items included, excluded, leased and leaned, smart home features. We've already established all of that. Seller representation. The seller represents that unless otherwise specified in writing. The seller is unaware of any notice of default reported against the property. I don't know how you wouldn't know that you have a default reported. You get an NOD in the mail. Uh, the seller is unaware of any delinquent amounts due under any loan secured or by uh, or other obligation affecting the property. Uh, is unaware of any bankruptcy, insolvency, or similar proceedings affecting the property. Is unaware of any litigation, arbitration, administrative action, government investigation, or other pending or threatening action that affects the or may affect the property or the seller's ability to transfer it. And the seller is unaware of any current pending or proposed special assessment affecting the property. The seller shall promptly notify broker in writing if something, if he becomes aware of something like this during the listing period. So this is the seller telling you that they are not aware of any of these horrible bad things. If, uh, if it pops up and they were aware, they were lying to you. And you could be, and you could receive compensation because this would be the seller blocking your ability to market the house. Okay, so they got to make sure you got to read that with them. Hey, are you aware of any of this? No. Okay, great. Broker and seller responsibilities. We've seen this before. We all exercise due diligence, reason, reasonable care. Um, this one's a little bit more important. Presentation of offers. Remember. It defaults, we present offers as soon as it's practicable, immediately, more or less, unless we've set it to be on a certain day or on a certain number of days after we go active. This is a advisory to the seller. So there are different strategies for obtaining the best offer for the seller. Seller is advised that certain buyers may prefer not to be in a competitive situation and either may not make an offer if there is instructions that all offers will be presented at a later specified time, or may try to make a preemptive offer that will expire shortly, hoping that the seller will accept it before the presentation date. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Has anybody ever seen an offer come in that's good for 24 hours, mm -hmm. right? Because they know it's gonna be a competitive situation and they want you to answer it now or let it go, right? Or, oh geez, offers are gonna be, uh, presented on Monday. So and we're here on a Thursday, we better write, we're going to get into a bidding war, right? Everybody knows buyers might not want to do it. So you need to let the seller know. Some buyers may not want to. <clears throat> Additionally, certain buyers may not be able or allowed to pay commission to a buyer's broker. So that, that kind of reflects back to people that either don't have the financial means or possibly still that BA buyer, right? That's not allowed to pay compensation to a buyer's broker. These buyers may request that the seller to pay the buyer's broker through a term in the purchase agreement or through a separate compensation agreement. Seller is advised to discuss and consider the best strategy for the seller related to the presentation of offers. So this is a really great sentence to read because what does it bring up again? The fact that a buyer can ask the seller directly through the contract to pay for the buyer's broker. Okay, so really good. So then it goes into, yes, are we going to uh, present them as soon as possible or are we gonna set uh, a later date? 
pretty, pretty basic. Supplemental letters we talked about. Um, it defaults as we're not gonna present them, but it does say the seller instructs the broker to present letters. The broker advises the seller that buyer's letters may contain information about protected classes or characteristics and such information should not be used in the seller's decision of whether to accept, reject, or counter a buyer's offer. If the seller relies on buyer's letters, the seller is acting against the broker's advice and should seek the advice of counsel before doing so. That's how we protect ourselves. And it mentions the FHDA, the Fair Housing Disclosure and Advisory. Okay, so they're doing it against our um, advice. Okay, seller in good faith. Seller agrees to consider offers presented by the broker and to act in good faith to accomplish the sale of the property by, amongst other things, making the property available for showings at reasonable times and subject to paragraph 2C4, referring to broker all inquiries of any party interested in the property. Seller is responsible for determining what price to list and, the sell, and sell the property. Okay, so again, this kind of goes back to yeah. the seller blocking you. If the seller says, no, I made it available for showings. I just said they got to be there between two and three in the morning. That's <laughs> not making it reasonably available. Okay, so again, good faith. All right. Um, seller agrees to indemnify, defend, and hold the broker harmless for all claims, disputes, litigations, judgments, and costs arising out of any incorrect or incomplete information supplied by the seller or from any material facts that the seller knows but fails to disclose. Again, so outs for us, right? An entire section on agency, the possibility of dual agency, the fact that um, uh, the listing agent may show properties and may show properties other than the seller's property. They're gonna show them to anybody. And we might have, we may actually have competing buyers and sellers, uh, you know, basically your, your possible representation of more than one buyer seller. It's, it's done here again. Now here's the, we talked about before the unrepresented buyer. If a buyer interested in viewing the seller's property is not already represented by a real estate broker and such buyer refuses to be represented by a broker, the seller authorizes us, the broker, to obtain signed documentation from such buyer refusing representation by a broker. The broker shall provide the buyer at the earliest time a disclosure of non-representation, such as the buyer non-agency form, known as the BNA, or the open house visitor non-agency disclosure and sign-in, the form OHNA-SI. So one of them's for open houses, and the other one is they want to see the property. They've called you. They don't want to be represented by you. So you're just going to go open the door for them. They sign a BNA, right? And you take them in the house. You don't talk about the house. You can walk them through the house. You can say things like, this is the dining room. This is the kitchen. This is the bathroom. But you can't talk about that. You can't talk about anything that requires a license. All right. So uh, let's see. Basic has always been in the other, this is, protects us against things being stolen out of the house. Um, let's see. Got to let people know if there's audio and video recordings up. Uh, you're not supposed to put in hidden cameras, nanny cams, never put cameras in rooms that are implied to have privacy. So closets, uh, bathrooms, I would say probably even bedrooms shouldn't have cameras in those rooms. Cameras should be limited to, you know, kitchens, dining rooms, living rooms, et cetera. Um, photographs, lockbox, we talked about those already. Uh, tenant occupied properties. If the seller does not occupy the property, the seller should be responsible for obtaining the occupant's written permission for use of the lockbox. That's the form KLA. And if the property is to be sold with the tenant still in it, they, uh, you must, uh, so the seller must notify you if that's their intention and uh, every counter offer that you write on an offer must have a TOPA, tenant occupied property addendum, right? You don't want the TOPA to be something that comes up 16, 17 days or 25 days in the contract. The buyer needs to know immediately whether or not, he, as they're writing an offer, whether or not the house is planned to be delivered with the tenant still in it, okay? 
uh, basic mediation uh, and arbitration is always before. And then we have our built-in RCSD down here at the bottom. Remember, if we have an entity, a corporation, an LLC, a probate, a partnership, a trust, whatever we have, if we fill this section out, we do not have to have the RCSD. It is no longer legally required or required. Okay, this is the RCSD. I like that. So yeah, yeah. I, 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 and then when people start asking one. you for an RCSD, like yeah. no, I don't need one. It's already yeah, there. I've had that happen. Where they ask Twice. you for one? Like it's already there. It's already there. Yeah. Oh, it is. Well, we still need one anyway. Our no. aid broker says we need one. No, did you read the sentence? It's not required. No, no, but you're going to do this on a uh, on the RPA also. Oh, okay. The RPA signature boxes for both buyer and seller, there's entity buyers and sellers section. And if you fill them out, then you're no longer required to provide the RCSD. So, all right, guys, any questions about this listing agreement? Did you, did you learn anything new today? Except for the six statutory disclosures. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I kind of like how it goes more in detail. So. Yeah, I think it's easier. I think it's a much I easier. Like the grid. I think yeah. well, I think it's a much easier, um, a much easier negotiation for my compensation now. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about other agents. I'm just going to talk about me. Yeah. I'm just going to walk in there and say these are my prices. You don't like my prices? Go someplace else. You know, I don't have to try to figure out how I'm going to split stuff up. You know, how am I going to preserve my three? Am I going to go five, three, two? Am I, you know, what am I going to, how am I going to do it? You just, you just go in there and just go, hey, yeah, for me, it's easy now. I've got my pricing sheet. I walk in, they already seen it. It's either two, three, or three and a half. You either get two service, three service, or three and a half service. Simple. But any other questions about this? No? Good, good training, bad training? Good training. Good training. All right, good. All right. Going to, uh, out of area sellers. This is kind of something that you need to sit down with. I usually always do sit down with my buyers and sellers. Out of area sellers, out of area buyers? Sellers. But oh, like the house is here, but they, so it's, this a, is, it's a rental. Yeah. Okay. This is, yeah. You know, I got to go over all this stuff. They can either get really good at Zoom or uh, the other one. Yeah, Zoom. FaceTime. FaceTime. Yeah. Zoom is probably the best for this because you can put it up on the screen and it's not going to shake around. Yeah. You can also use. Your zip forms. Zip forms has a built-in feature to do this, where they can, you can collaborate together on it. It does. Uh -huh. What? Yeah, uh, we just don't ever use it. Interesting. Yeah. But Zoom is probably the easiest way, because you could actually do this in zip. You could go into zip form, share the zip form screen, and as you guys are talking about it, check and fill in everything in your form as you're doing it with them. 